Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The oyster actually keeps the shoreline intact. Getting an hour, two hours every week where you and a group of people are going to listen to each other and genuinely respond, it's a, it's a great experience. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard, and this is Charlottesville Inside Out. Tonight's theme is insult to injury. Please welcome our revered and fearless leader, Joel Jones. Our guest today is a playwright with a long history in the Charlottesville and New York City theater scenes. Since 2012, two of his main interests have been teaching and performing improv and storytelling. Join us today as we catch up with Joel Jones, co-founder of Big Blue Door. Come on. Uh, when I was young, I, I thought the, the ideal way to deal with a problem, the sort of best way to deal with it, the fantasy way, was you put your clothes in a backpack and your guitar in a case and you leave. And you don't tell anyone where you're going or why. Joel, talk about the importance of improv and storytelling. We feel it's kind of a means to an end of getting people to listen to each other. And, and two parts of that, one is to get people better at explaining themselves or telling their own story and also getting people better at listening to other people's story, developing listening skills. And so we've kind of these two things, the true stories and the improv. And true stories is kind of helping people to share things that have happened to them. So we learn what real life is like. What are people actually like? Uh, and then the... The improv is kind of letting you actually walk in someone else's shoes, learning how to adopt a different character, learning how to use parts of yourself and express that in different ways and, and seeing how that could play out in different points of view and different patterns of behavior. You've been very involved in the theater scene. Tell us just a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. I went to, um, I, I went to school here. I did theater in high school. Went to college in College of Charleston. I studied anthropology, classics, and kind of moved away from theater. I moved back here at a time when live arts and offstage theater were being founded. Uh -huh. My friend John Quinn, you remember uh -huh. him, of course. And I was writing a lot of plays, and there was a company in New York uh, called Third Man that actually had roots, roots here. And they, had, uh, they were doing a lot of my work up there. And so uh, I just kind of wanted to be in a bigger place. You know, so I went there, and after that, I gradually found the, the storytelling scene up there, like The Moth and things like that. And I was taking classes. I was like, wouldn't this be great to bring back to Charlottesville? So that's why we started Big Blue Door down here. Yeah. Why'd you call it Big Blue Door? I was working for the Magnet Theater, which is a comedy theater in New York. Uh, the guy who runs that, or started it, uh, Armando Diaz, was kind of teaching me to be a teacher, which was what I wanted to do, teaching me to teach improv, and I was doing performance as well. And Armando, uh, in an exchange, I was helping them do construction. They were building this, uh, this uh, training center, this uh, rehearsal space, and I was working on a door, and Jen and I were trying to come up with a name at the same time I was actually hanging a door for them. You know, I'm a carpenter, I was hanging this door and I was painting it blue and I was like, what should we call it? And blue reminded me of Virginia and you know, a door, the symbolism of you know, having people in the door, open the door. And, uh, right. and at the time, you know, everything had an acronym and so just to have a name that wasn't an acronym, I thought would be fun. Not apple shaped, rather pear. Dun, 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 dun. I'm not boring, I got lots of flair. flair. <laughs> it's like this opportunity to get together with other grown-ups and play. It's super fun. It's the highlight probably of any student or performer's week is going to, to rehearsal or going to class for improv. Um, it's a really great experience and it also helps kind of teach you in some ways to experience what's happening right then and there. The philosophy came out of the idea, some of it out of improv actually, that anybody can do it. Also, we wanted to rely on ourselves and not rely on donors. So Big Blue Door is different than many other arts organizations in that it's really our classes that keep us going. These are really great class figurines you have. You know, uh, my family's been making these since the 1600s. Wow, that's a long time. 
What is the difference between long form improv and short form improv? Well, short form came first, uh, kind of in the 50s, and it's uh, you kind of get two people on stage and you kind of throw something at them, okay? Be an animal, use an accent. In the middle of the scene, you throw something else at them. And people really enjoy that, and it, it can make people kind of uh, learn to be really resilient in, in a way and, and being able to handle all kinds of pressure. Uh, long form developed really in the 80s, and the education part of it came really in the 90s of uh, instead of making people uh, do something like, you know, drink the cup uh, with like a, like, a, like a dolphin would. Uh, instead, you, you talk, well, let's do a scene where actually two people drinking coffee and see what happens. And then you, you're actually drawing on your own experiences and your own reaction to the other person. Uh -huh. and, and, and it creates this comedy material that isn't, hasn't ever been used before. So it's a very funny and interesting thing. And it's very new. You know, it's we're the first people that brought it here. No one else was doing it. And uh, the guy who developed it more than anyone was Armando Diaz, who taught me. So we're That's you know, exciting. cutting edge Charlotte. I know, floor. I love that. That's so great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so you offer classes in, in improv and you also you you work on stories and storytelling. Yeah. So talk about that philosophy. What what's involved there? When we first came down here, our first project on our own was Big Blue Door Jam, which was this true story show. It was in some ways it had a lot to do with uh, similar to The Moth in New York, uh, which is a storytelling show. People come with like six to eight minute true stories on a theme and they tell the stories. And it's a, it's a really interesting art form. It's, people are very funny and they're interesting and it's amazing to hear these lives of people around you. You know, everyone is surprisingly more interesting than TV characters or what you see in movies, which is incredible, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then most of these people are actually from the classes that we've taught. I was like, oh my goodness, I do comedy. Here's my number, we'll get coffee. Let me bestow my comedy knowledge onto you. I want to make my life seem interesting to strangers. And it's amazing to me some of the stories that come out of people that they themselves may not have known they had the last time we, we had met. I'm telling a true story about a time where I was publicly humiliated, which is very fun to talk about. She was like, oh my god, we just had our stand-up presentations today and Mickey was hilarious. He told this story about this horrible girl he went on a date with. <laughs> And I knew immediately, in my gut, that Mickey's story was about me. So what are secrets? Like, you know, what's the trick to improv? Right your best trick to improv is, is a strong point of view. So if you come out of a scene thinking of it as a situation, then someone else you think we're like, uh, you know, that we're these people. And then I come at it with, uh, I suddenly surprise you by being, you know, something completely different. You're thrown into it for a loop. But if you come at it with a strong point of view, especially like in the expression of your body and your attitude, like uh, I'm just going to be a very specific point of person. Then if we end up on the moon, I can, you know, and we're here we're at the moon, but yeah, it's important in the moon base to be, or if we're accountants and I can be that same character, if I turn out to be, we're hunters in the swamp, I can have the same, well, I've got to shoot, the, you know, you can have the same kind of point that you take things from to, d to do anything. If you're doing stories, uh -huh. you know, one thing I would say is, you know, keep yourself the center of your story. So instead of like, uh, this happened, say, I saw this happen, or this happened to me, or I decided to do this. Even if it's an arbitrary thing, like I decided to turn left in the road uh, rather than right in the road, uh, and then something happens that will feel more meaningful than I was just driving down the road right. and this thing happened. The fans, the fans they, they, they want balls in the back of the net, and at the end of the day, my responsibility is to the team. And yes, was it underhanded? but I got results. <laughs> it felt like an amazing so liberation, nice. and I discovered that that's what I wanted to do. I said, I don't want to tell, I don't want to give speeches, I want to tell stories. It's an interesting way to get kind of in touch with your own emotions and thoughts too, because that's what makes good improv, is that personal point of view and those personal emotions. All of a sudden I thought, someone's telling these stories about her life, and she's excited and entertained, and we're all laughing, and we're all coming together with, you know, this moment with her. And I loved it and wanted to bring that to Charlottesville. And so how many different groups do you think of, like imp improv groups now have come out of it that, that perform in town? Yeah, know, we, most, of, most of the people kind of, re we recombine into groups over and over again. So we've had, you know, 20 or 30 groups, but they're mostly the, the same four groups that are kind of reconfigured. That's still pretty yeah, exciting. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing how many students. We, we run, you know, three classes at a time, usually a true stories class and a couple of um, uh, improv classes and then two improv team performance workshops 
that are rehearsals basically, and about five things at once, uh, you know, five different sessions during the year. So do you do other people in the community get involved too in, in coming up with ideas and involved yeah, with production? Um, yeah, you're you're sure. interested in that. Well, Jen and I kind of started it, and then she has not been able to do as much in recent years because she's been working more, but uh, some of our improvisers who came up through initially, or their classes now teach, so uh, a lot of people come up and then they do more and more, and it's fantastic. It's really, it's really gratifying to see people because I would love you know other people to do everything <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I can just kick back and there are other classes too yeah we do sketch writing comedy writing right and, um, okay. we will eventually once we have a more fixed space uh, develop more of a writing program welcome to Jack and Jill's house of lead <laughs> that's right <laughs> we're gonna be snug as two bugs under this lead rug you Take this big risk, stepping out in front of an audience and having absolutely no idea what is about to happen. And you just have to trust your teammates and build the next thing. You'll get to see a show that no one else will ever get to see. It's a really great thing. You get to hold on to something really ephemeral. Um, and I think that's one of the really big appeals. The other thing is it's, it's really funny. Um, you end up being able to explore some themes that sometimes you don't get to explore in like sketch or, or short form or things like that. Next time I say, sweetheart, I'm sorry, sweetheart, you're stressed. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I signed up for the storytelling class because I'm currently in the process of applying to medical schools and I wanted practice with being composed with talking to strangers and I feel like this has given me excellent practice with that. Uh, I went on a couple dates with this guy from Great Britain and he caught me practicing his accent under my breath, which he did not find endearing. <laughs> Performance in front of people is one of the most uncomfortable things for people. It's one of the number, number one human fears, right? So um, you can use that in your performance. You know, shy people, introverted people, awkward people, that's great because you, you want your performance to have stakes. You want there to be something at stake. Right. But if you're so polished and you are so confident which is what we always try to make people, then how can you lose? And if you can't lose, there's nothing at stake, so nothing right. can fall. Whereas right. you get shot people out there and they're barely holding it together, it's really great to watch and it's really fun to see. And when they, when they succeed, it's like you feel like cheering. It's awesome. And it humanizes yeah. you and an audience likes that. Yeah. yeah. And people can always look at your website to see yeah. where you all are. Yeah. So, so what are your goals? What, what's the goal for the future? Uh, we definitely are going to continue to put on new kinds of improv shows, things that people haven't seen before. Uh, we are hoping always to uh, expand our our, uh, our oral history project. We're at Trueville, and uh, we're looking to do that. We're also interested in sketch comedy and plays and things that are. Uh, we'd love to expand the writing part of our program and uh, get some shows up that can explore uh, what life is like for all of us here in uh, Little, Little Bill. Working on telling true stories has made me be more honest and vulnerable when I just have conversations in my real life. I don't know, I feel like it makes me a better person. There's a way that you can uh, address some of the embarrassing stuff that's happened to you and uh, feel strengthened by it. Big Blue Door is the most fun I have in my life these days. Does that sound sad? <laughs> it's really fun. Oysters are great to eat, but did you know they keep our waters clean, our shorelines intact, and provide habitat for many marine species? Unfortunately, they are also endangered. Today we are going to visit with a local educator and designer whose passion for working with concrete inspired her to help change this situation. Join us as we talk with Evelyn Tickle, creator of Grow Oyster Reefs. Come on! So we're here at your home studio because this is where it all got started. Yes. Tell us what inspired you to grow oyster reefs. Well, I was at a little bit of a turning point in my life. I've been doing lots of concrete work as an architectural designer and um, fabricator, making all sorts of very sexy um, accoutrements for the home, such as bathtubs and fountains and wall panels and, and you know pretty much you name it, a little bit of furniture as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided I wanted to do something more important with my concrete. And I started thinking about what that was. I really didn't know what that would be. And I came up with the idea that I wanted to invent a sustainable concrete. Okay, and then, but then how did that lead you to oysters? Well, it's 
So I was really into, which I still am, into a type of designing called biomimicry. And what that is, is that you look at nature and you see how nature has designed certain things like some great flying animal and sometimes cars are inspired by them, some of the high tech car designs. And right. So right. I was like, well, what that I know of or can I find that's natural that makes some sort of concrete that might be sustainable because typically things in nature are sustainable, right? So right. I didn't exactly know what to do, but I thought, I think maybe an oyster actually has a concrete and makes a concrete to be able to attach itself mm -hmm. to a substrate or to a reef or to another oyster, preferably. Right. So I went hunting this formula and I looked and I looked and I discovered along the way this plight of the oysters. The oyster is a keystone species, which means that if we remove it from the environment, our world will be forever changed. One of its main jobs that we're very interested in is that it filters the water, like right. 50 gallons of water per day. And, it, and, it, and it's a habitat for other animal mm -hmm. forms. I mean, so, so it's important for so many different reasons. Yeah. So then you decided, okay, I'm gonna create this. I'm, I'm going to mimic <laughs> an oyster reef. And, and your schooling is in architecture mm -hmm. and you're a teacher and you're a designer. So how did you come about doing this? Well, the first thing that I did, I did not know that I was going to make a sort of small simulated reef. I did different, really very design looking things. And finally, I kind of got my ego out of the way a little bit and I looked further into biomimicry and I thought there's a really good, great reason that the oyster reef is um, is made in the or has developed in the way that it's developed. And that's because, want a little science lesson Oh, here? do, okay. I do. We would like okay. a science <laughs> lesson, Okay, so please. here's the science lesson. So the oyster, an adult oyster will um, release about a million embryonic oysters into the water column. And so this, this embryonic oyster moves up through the reef, it finds a little spot that it likes and it attaches on and it stays there for life. It doesn't go anywhere else. If it's attached to an oyster shell, it uses the nutrients in the shell. Uh -huh. And that's the reason that I matched the concrete formula that I was working towards and I developed first to closely match that of the, of the oyster itself. Okay. And that, in testing, has been really exciting. So the f really, because the first time you put down oyster shells, right? Right, in a concrete base. In a I concrete stuck base. the oysters in a, in a pattern. And then you put one of your reefs. Right. And then when you went back later, <laughs> what did you find? Story. Oh my, you, you described it as a bouquet. It was, it was like a bouquet. There were all sorts of things living in it. There were sponges and there were all sorts of things. There were little fish and little crabs and not green crabs, but the good kind of crabs in there. And it was really a, yeah, it was already a fully formed thing. It was like really big. It was like a puff ball of things. So, and so the other one was just kind of like, okay, well here it is. Right. Yeah. So you've discovered something that's that's really incredible and so now you're you're sharing it and you're working on different projects so so this is something that there are government organizations that mm -hmm. work with oysters there are there's nature conservancies there are people with their private oyster mm -hmm. farms so talk about some of the projects that you're working on and how and how okay. you're helping with these yeah I'd love to so the nature conservancy in Maine contacted me and they were to do a reef with artificial substrate and they chose my product, I have to That's say. Fantastic. So they chose Grow Oyster Reefs Reef Tile, and we put a hundred of them in, and I got to go up there and help the divers were up there, so the divers were placing them. It was very scientific, which was really fun with me, and there was this large weighted um, grid in the water, and they seeded these, which means they put baby oysters attached to them. They put them in a big tank, and they kind of force them on there. Okay. And then they used it without being seeded. So, and then they tested against natural shell, and natural shell seeded. So we've got a really cool, you know, great experiment going. Yeah. Well, and then in 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 Maryland, you're working with scientists. Mm -hmm. You're you're trying some other experiments yeah. with these. So talk about that. Okay. So this is pretty cool stuff. I'm working with um, two different scientists, um, Dr. May and Dr. Kangas. And Dr. May contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in putting algae in my concrete. I was like, well, yeah. Of course, you know, <laughs> like really algae. And they um, 
Dr. Kanga said, scrubs this algae off the surface of the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. Okay. So I think they have this this like algae scrubber. I'm not really sure what it looks like or anything like that, but I, I got the algae and it's very lightweight. It's very interesting. And they thought I would put like 2% in, but I decided I would pump it up and really see it put 50% in, but they're testing to see if the algae, if it would attract more marine species. And so we poured about 100 of these. And you've probably seen those jetties out about in the water all mm -hmm. over the place at mm -hmm. direct water flow, and they're made out of these really large rocks. And originally I invented it so that you could take the reef disc in your hand and you could just shove it into the nooks and crannies. Oh. And then because the, the jetties are not performing living breakwaters or reefs or anything because the rocks are too large and too slick on the surface uh -huh. and the gaps are so big that the water's really rushing in, pushing the, you know, anything that might attach onto it. So the idea is you give them a chance with something that's baited in a way and then we'll get all sorts of another ecosystem. And that word is called like a living breakwater. Okay. So, What's so cool about these and what we did in Maryland is we tied them on to strings. So we had four different tests. We have uh, a CaCO3 concrete with algae and without, and then an off-the-shelf concrete that you can just buy at Lowe's with and without algae. So the strings are um, the big ropes are like that kind of look like these long necklaces are hanging close to the National Aquarium on the Inner Harbor. And so we're testing there. And these have lots of uses for the um, residential homeowner as well because they can tie ropes onto these and I'll send them some all connected and they can hang them underneath their docks because oysters are actually something that gets stolen a lot. So well, they have some options yeah, for and the, the homeowners and the commercial guys because the commercial people actually in, in like the Northeast in which some of the ones in the Chesapeake Bay are starting to do too, they want to catch their own spat. So they don't want to have to their always own go spat. To their own spat. So you never really said what spat was. Oh, yeah. So what spat? Spat is just the embryonic oyster. Okay. And it attaches to the oyster, and that's right. the embryonic oyster when it's gotten a little bit bigger. And this is probably right above spat nomenclature. And the the mixture. I mean, mm -hmm. there there are other people who are doing this or who have done this in the past, but their shapes are totally different, mm -hmm. and they don't have whatever secret recipe that they we're not going to learn about here today <laughs> anyway but um, but these are these are really doing well they are doing very well and I'm really pleased because it's like I think the reason that the oysters are growing so much quicker on mine is that you know on the oyster shell it, it's pretty hard right and this right. is you can see all the yummy stuff and this one actually gets all calcified the calcium actually leaches out of the of the product and it makes the whole sort of surface very, very high concentrate. And it's more available to the oyster, it's easier to access, yeah. is, is my um, designer guess on that. And you're you're really excited about the educational piece of it all too. Oh yeah, I love I that I mean, you part. are a teacher. Yeah, so. I love that part. So, you know, so much, um, so much help is needed to restore the oysters and, and the community aspect of it. It's yeah. really important. And a lot of high schools have have reefs that they do through their, you know, through their science classes and stuff. So I'm hoping to engage. That's um, exciting. Academic. Group. That's exciting. So as an entrepreneur, someone who um, is a designer turned somewhat scientist. So <laughs> sort what, of. what? What? JD what? JD scientist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What? Um, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are who are interested in mm. trying to to do something that maybe makes a difference too? I would say the first part of it is that you really have to know that it might take a while, you mm -hmm. know, to be really situated and really patient, even though you're still developing the product, the products take a while to develop. And so I think you've got to really love what you do and be interested in it yeah. and be interested in it in all the different phases. And I can't say I love getting out here in the rain and pouring a bunch of concrete but I, I do it and I do like that part. I'm anxious to hand that part over <laughs> to, some, to somebody when I move out of my bootstrapping stage, but I'm coming to making a new product from a designer and from an environmental you know, right. standpoint. So I, I, where I have to learn and where I sort of hone up my skills is in the, in the business world. And why is it so rewarding to you? Oysters are really fascinating. I mean, they're they're sort of very addictive. I love to eat them, and I love to. Um, I'm excited about the the future of it. I'm interested architecturally in the fact that you know restructuring um, 
you know, the earth so that it's not sliding down into the water is very interesting to me, making sure that the waters aren't rising in, in urban areas. But also I'm excited about the new product I'm working on, which is a more enhanced, a stronger version. And so that we can use it to pour um, all sorts of seawalls and larger things like bridge abutments and foundation pieces for bridges so that we can develop habitat. We can right. also neutralize the waters while we're at it. And then I've got a series of um, form liners that would I would put in the, the large concrete form so that we could make nooks and crannies in these in these very large pieces. So therefore I get back up from the handheld size back up to an architectural and civic sort of scale of things. I'm really excited about that. No more excited than I am about this, but yeah. it's, it's nice that I can grow with it and there just seems to be so many more things that need to be done and investigated and yeah, yeah I like it's, the never ending part of it. It's very exciting yeah. and, it, and it's really good work. Th thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me here and being interested and letting me have an opportunity to kind of share the work and the ideas and hopefully it catches on and thank you. That's it for this week. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard. Join us next time on Charlottesville Inside Out. Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you.